on to our next session now. Um, and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Adrian, Adrian Underhill to everybody. He's, uh, um, he's an international consultant, author, speaker, and trainer with ELT interests that include pronunciation, improvisation, in teaching, leadership and organizational development, and more recently demand high teaching. And uh, from 1972 to 1999, he was an IH teacher, trainer, and director. I've known Adrian for years. He was uh, my vice principal, vice president, when I was president of IATEFL, and I was his vice president when he was president. Um, mm. One of my favorite stories of Adrian's perceptiveness and uh, constructive rigor was actually when we were in Palestine. Uh, we were doing a consultancy project there and we had a week uh, visiting schools, seeing what a challenge the, uh, was some amazing teaching, but what a challenge the state of the infrastructure was. We had a, at the very end of the week, we were invited to meet the minister who is a charming woman and an ex-English teacher. And one of her aides was extremely excited about the possibility of introducing interactive whiteboards, which at that time were fairly um, unusual and a lot of discussion about the great, their use or not. And this aide was saying, <coughs> you know, this is what we want to do. This is what we want to have in all our classes and was getting very, very excited about this. And Adrian very, uh, well, not, perhaps not quietly enough said, Yes, well, we tend to find these devices work better when there's a source of electricity in the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Adrian's talk is about International House and its uh, unique atmosphere of practice. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much, Simon, and uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you to International House for uh, uh, living well. 60 um, with more promising life to come. So uh, we're going to celebrate that and I feel very much like celebrating that. Uh, thank you also to the previous uh, speakers. Um, I uh, feel very much in tune with what uh, Scott is saying uh, about uh, dogma, particularly, I think, uh, with uh, these references to what I call the organization. And also to Jeremy's uh, um, take on repetition, in terms of repetition, I really do agree with and um, endeavour to put into practice whenever I can, also being a, a, a musician like Jeremy. Uh, <coughs> and also uh, Maureen, um, I'm, I'm probably going to pick up on some of the things that Maureen has said because this is my uh, theme. Now, uh, as Simon said, I, uh, have, I was with International House from 1973 to 99, 26 years. Actually, I started in, 20, in 72 because that's when I trained, when I worked at Shaftesbury Avenue. Uh, and then I went to Hastings. And um, I, st uh, I went to Hastings uh, the, at the end of 72 and started work there on a course. Uh, which was an international house course. And they had just got a group of 22 Libyans who were to be taught as a closed group uh, on, in some seaside resort. And John happened upon Hastings where he found Maurice Conlin who ran the small school. Anyway, we worked there jointly. And at the end of that six month contract, John and Maurice decided to open a second international house school in the UK. So International House Hastings was born uh, in 1973. And uh, they found magnificent premises, which was, the, which was and is the old Palace Hotel. The Palace Hotel is still there. International House is not. International House was sold in 1999. So all of us that were on board the good ship IHH, IH Hastings, have been elsewhere since 1999. But here is the Ho Palace Hotel. And that was built in about 1880. That was the time of Hastings Pier. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a bit shabby there, but it wasn't always quite as shabby. Uh, 
just here behind this rather large bus is the front door. And here, which is now called Bailey's Agency, uh, was the bookshop, the International House Hastings Bookshop, they call it. And we are standing on the beach. So this whole thing overlooks the sea. All of these rooms overlook the sea. They still do now, but they're empty. And uh, <coughs> just here, I've got to tell you this. Uh, this is shops along the shore, and this is the Pig in Paradise pub. So anyone who's ever been to Hastings and been to our school will have spent any time they weren't in the classroom in the Pig and Paradise. So that's a little bit. But here, on the first floor, were classrooms and offices, and here was the hotel ballroom. And this was the most... Sorry, sorry. Here was the yeah, yeah. Pardon me. Here was the uh, pardon me. Here was the hotel uh, ballroom, which uh, for us was a student club. Fabulous big place. Uh, it doesn't look very big there, but when you're inside, it is it is it is really huge, overlooking the sea. And this is where t students and teachers could meet. And then we had all these classrooms along here. And uh, my office was there, that window there, and that's uh, during the time when I was uh, uh, director of the executive school. And we also had all this floor as well. Uh, and at the back, you could look over uh, less interesting things like uh, damp walls and uh, pigeon, pigeon nests. <coughs> so this was the Palace Hotel. It was built in, is that still on? Doesn't look like it. There's no light there. Should there be a light? It's on, okay. Uh, so this is the Palace Hotel, built in 1880. It ceased to be a hotel about Paris for IH Barcelona, which I visited often especially in those earlier days, and um, IH London, which where I was all the time, and I particularly mean Shaftesbury Avenue and 106 Piccadilly. And the aim of doing this is really to try to Paris. just take this little opportunity to stand, uh, stand back and l try to identify some of the desirable organisational qualities so that we can, first of all, on this anniversary, appreciate our heritage um, whether we here all work for IH now or not. Um, also, uh, to kind of learn from our own lived experience some of the qualities that make a school excellent or indeed even exceptional, because these are things which I think are learnable and are puttable into practice. So uh, the things that I'm going to try to identify are, I think, um, qualities which uh, apply to any uh, the growing of any teaching organisation of excellence. Um, right, so I have one other slide of the building. I haven't any slides of classrooms, but as you go in that magnificent front door, which is behind the bus at the moment, you would find something like this. And that was an Otis lift put in in about 1890. So if you are a collector of ancient lifts, I recommend you to pay a visit to Hastings. And it contravenes all health and safety, because even if you stick your elbow out as you're going up, you can lose it. But no one did during the entire 26 years. Everyone, uh, other things happened, but not that. So, uh, <coughs> some features of the IH atmosphere of practice. Now, the originator and main owner of IH Hastings, Morris Conlin, who now lives in uh, California, shared John Haycroft's view uh, and his vision, and we all benefited very much from the guidance from IH London. And um, <clears throat> I guess the thing that was most important for us, first and foremost in Hastings, was something like this. It's a bit of a hack phrase, shared vision, <coughs> but sometimes it's true. And then you suddenly realise why people go on about it. Most of them go on about it when it isn't true, uh, to try and make it come true perhaps. Um, <clears throat> but there really was, uh, uh, you know, a shared vision. And I'm going to come back to this, because obviously it has a lot to do with things that previous speakers have spoken about, especially Maureen, and to do with the teacher training, and amongst other things. Uh, a second thing was that Morris Conlin had a particularly hands-off um, approach to leadership, as I believe did uh, John, uh, not laissez-faire at all. Uh, because it was a form of uh, hands-off supported by transparency and criticality and accountability and, and so on, but no micromanagement. So my second quality is something like this, dispersed <laughs> leadership. Not devolved leadership, dispersed, actually, you know, letting go of the leadership so it actually is in the hands of other people, not delegated. 
people dispersed. Uh, plus these things which you need when you start dispersing leadership, you need those things to kind of uh, help it fit together. <clears throat> um, so, uh, you know, that was the second key thing. Then uh, a third thing arises from that uh, in a way, which is that um, conversation and exchange of, of views was encouraged both by Morris, by the management, by the ideal of IH itself, permeating down uh, from London, um, by the spaces and nooks and crannies in this extraordinary building, by the fact that there was loads of places to meet. And so this also became, I think, a factor, that there were spaces and places <coughs> for conversations. What kind of conversations? Well, conversations about whatever was important to whoever was there. And with that went a kind of um, sense of um, surfacing undiscussables, which normally don't get surfaced. That's why they're undiscussable. Uh, but we would have this kind of question, which is like, you know, <laughs> we get together for a meeting. What is there that we simply you can't discuss? Yourself kind of caught in a, in, in a sort of a and liberating you know, the first question. And then, and then um, okay, let's talk about it. So, you know, you what can't we discuss? What is it that you're thinking of now, but you won't say because we can't discuss it? <laughs> that one. Uh, and there were forums and, uh, you know, that covered everything from food to uh, student life to teacher pay to staff pantomime and uh, school policies. So uh, part of the conversations included this, that anyone could get involved in discussing school policies. What's going on in the school? before adoption. The next factor, which I think is part of this little uh, jigsaw, it is something that you'd be very familiar with. It's this, the fact that International House had teacher training going on here throughout the year, Hastings throughout the year, with the what were then the International House four-week courses, became RSA and later CELTA, but the, that format, and then the diploma kinds of courses, and then multiple other shorter, usually two-week courses for uh, teachers, especially in the summer. This meant that everyone, every classroom had an open door. This meant that people were wandering into and out of classrooms. This meant that people were used to being observed. This meant that people were used to discussing their lessons. This meant that there was a kind of feedback culture. Um, and this meant that, you know, when there's a feedback culture, feedback can start uh, the other side of defensiveness. That's an extraordinary thing. So you're not spending the first part of your feedback discussion trying to soften things up and say the right, you know, you actually get down to business pretty quickly. And, and I would, I'd hazard a guess that this is uh, characteristically true, maybe not always utterly, but characteristically true of IHs in general everywhere. Uh, and this meant something like this. So not only was there a, you know, a, um, a culture of letting yourself be seen and requesting or receiving feedback, but of giving feedback, being asked to give feedback to others, not only the feedback givers, but anyone else. And this was whether it was up or horizontal or down, in all directions. So feedback in all directions, I think, uh, you know, was a, a really healthy quality of the whole IH enterprise that I have known. <clears throat> and the, something else comes from that, because when you can start to uh, uh, tell the truth, more or less, tell the truth as you see it, relatively speaking, <clears throat> and give feedback and be non-defensively about it, uh, non-defensive about it and so on, uh, something else happens, which is that uh, it becomes increasingly safe to be yourself. It becomes increasingly okay to be who you are. 
and to have a sense of being liberated in amongst the organization to bring yourself to work, not to leave yourself at home. You bring yourself to work and to work with that self and without, you know, hiding. And so from that, I, I you know, want to say something like this, I think. You know, you feel safe. You don't have to pretend. Um, you know, that would be an interesting criterion. Do you, in your workplace, have to pretend? Well, that's a funny question to ask people because we don't usually ask it, but perhaps we ought to. When and how do you, are you, perhaps you're not even aware of it, so we should ask it, and then gradually people become aware of, oh, yeah, actually, if I was really on my own, I'd do that, but since there's everyone, I'll do that. <clears throat> so I think this is also a characteristic not a blanket truth beautifully done in any sense, but a char definite characteristic of, of international house. Um, you know, working, practical atmosphere. And it follows from this, of course, as you can readily see, uh, that you know, if it's okay to be who you are and if it's okay uh, to give and receive feedback, then, as was, has already been mentioned by, by Maureen, uh, mistakes begin to occupy a quite different status. So, and of course, you know, we're, we're moving towards the thing that Maureen was talking about, this notion of, uh, you know, of a learning uh, organization. So as a, result, as a result of these various things, you, you know, you could feel free to experiment, to take risks, to, you know, to push the boat out, to be exposed. And uh, there was, certainly in Hastings, but I think this is uh, true of the other places, all the other places that I visited, a strong notion of teacher development as an attitude, you know, teacher development powered by the, the feeling of wanting to learn professionally. Um, and what you didn't really hear, but you did hear of, of some places, was, oh, we don't have any teacher development because the management don't encourage it. Or, oh, we don't have any teacher development because there isn't the time. Or we don't have any teacher development because there isn't enough money made available. And, of course, all of these are important factors, but they're not the thing. The thing in itself is an attitude towards learning, which actually, quite often, tends to bring about the time and the money that one wants. People are tend to be unwilling to put that up front. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I think another aspect of International House is this second bit here, you know, being encouraged to come up with new ways of doing things. Nothing is sacred. Everything could be done differently. And everyone can be listened to if they've got a new idea. So things could be tried out. Things could be experimented with. And I think part of that uh, is this kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a tangible feeling of inquiry, um, which I'd describe like this. You know, you could get people to listen to new ideas. It may sound like obvious stuff to say, but, uh, you know, it needs saying. Um, because that, I think, is a characteristic of a good place. I think that's a characteristic of international house. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that when we want to learn from what's good and maintain it, we need to start seeing these things and not just taking it for granted and whinging a bit when they disappear without being quite sure what's disappeared. <clears throat> so... A key factor in all this, I mean, I've pointed out a, a dozen things now. Uh, a key factor in all this, really, is um, that IH has shaped its own teachers, made its own teachers, right from the beginning. Didn't get them from somewhere else. They might have come from somewhere else, but it shaped its own teachers. And John and Brita offered this, you know, very extraordinary, fresh, inviting, inclusive approach I, I did my course a bit after Jeremy. It was in 1972. Derek Hooper was the trainer, and he was absolutely brilliant too. And I didn't quite know if I was on a, a drama course or a teaching course, or just you know uh, an enjoy life course with feedback. 
Um, but this was an extraordinary thing that they brought about gradually, and it got sort of consolidated into a week, and then two, and then eventually into a four-week course, which is uh, and, uh, what we know now is kind of quite a long way downstream, probably, from, from that. Um, so they brought about certain characteristics, and uh, there are many. I just listed some here. <clears throat> the active participation of students was extraordinary. That's really impacting. It's not so obvious to say now. But you can't take it for granted at all that this is what happens now. Um, this personable and open approach to people, which was so characteristic of, uh, of John and is so characteristic of, of, of this was, you know, this was um, kind of embedded in the way things worked. When John came to visit a school, he wouldn't be carrying two briefcases of stuff or even one briefcase of stuff, or even a rolled up newspaper. <laughs> he'd just have himself. And if he needed something to write on, he'd find an envelope or something. And if he'd sat in for a whole day watching people, he wouldn't take notes, but he'd remember each person and their lesson and discuss it, because there was a kind of connection there. It wasn't the grids being filled in about what people are and aren't doing. It was a, a personal response to that individual. There's something for us to learn from that. Not all of us can do that, but it's something to learn. Uh, and connected with that is this kind of realignment of the hierarchy, teacher, student, you know, and we are actually just sort of humans uh, trying to work together and all trying to learn. And uh, this, this non-exclusive methodology, which was kind of really open to people to uh, engage with uh, and to alter, it, uh, it wasn't exclusive. Um, so quite suddenly there was an exciting and unexpected alternative to uh, kind of current uh, academic approaches to, to training teachers, which were seen by contrast, wrongly or rightly, as somehow still maintaining distance between teachers and students, somehow promoting, in spite of their own words, a relative passivity of learners, uh, somehow still promoting a sort of teacher-centeredness um, and somehow losing cred because the, the trainers uh, of, of, of academic qualifications were not themselves active teachers on a daily basis. Anyway, the result of all this was something like this, <coughs> an approach that brought out the teacher in us. Even if you'd never thought of being a teacher, uh, you couldn't help the teacher being drawn out of you when you were in some of these uh, uh, training ac activities. <clears throat> now, uh, you know, in, in a sense, I'm plucking these nice statements uh, at, at random, and maybe I'm exaggerating, and I'm doing that just uh, to be clear as much as anything. I hope that you recognize these, uh, and I. I need to point out that, you know, when you take something whole, like an atmosphere of practice, you can slice it up lots of ways and look at individual parts. Oh, well, that's to do with that. Oh, that's to do with that, which is what I've been doing. But actually, none of it's really true. It's not like that. A whole is a whole. And when you take strips out and look at different bits, it's not the same thing at all. Nevertheless, we have to do that, but it's the whole that we have to work with. We have to put everything back into the whole. And what I came to, to know, I didn't know it at the time, but I only came to know it later, and this is referring back again to what Maureen said, is that these features of these IH schools were, you know, that characterized these IH schools were also part of the learning organization Jigsaw, um, which is uh, um, something put about very much in the 90s and in this century by uh, um, Peter Senge and uh, Mike Pedler, uh, Peter Senge in the States, Mike Pedler in the UK. Uh, and basically, here's a, a very simple definition. So it's an organization that constantly transforms itself by the learning of the people that work there. But, this is the catch, an organization that does lots of staff training is not a learning organization unless that staff training is linked up and part of some, you know, it's all connected up. So if you look at this the other way around, you get something like this.
And it's the same thing looked at from the other end of the telescope. And I, in a way, that's more interesting. We're not learning for ourselves, <laughs> though we are, and that's part of our motivation. We're not learning just to improve things to the customers, though we are, and that's part of the motivation. Actually, what we're doing is for the flourishing of the system itself. It is our learning that is keeping the system in orbit. And therefore, in this sense, learning is a systems quality. It's not just a bunch of individual qualities. It's actually a quality of the system. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that IH was a learning organization long before this term was invented. And I think that John and Breda understood that stuff long before it became part of uh, uh, organizational discourse. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that, uh, you know, staff would, uh, at all the schools, but particularly in London where I noticed it most, I guess, would learn all these wonderful things of International House and become such skillful super teachers and trainers and directors. And then they'd leave. And, uh, you know, <coughs> and go enticed away by other schools who also wanted slices of the IH cake. So I remember asking John in about uh, early 90s, I said, John, does it trouble you that people, uh, you know, learn all this stuff from the inside of this marvelous organization uh, and then leave and, and take it somewhere else to the opposition, you know, the opposition? And uh, John said, Um, in, in, in his, you know, for those of you who knew him, in his expansive and airy and, and, and largely convincing way. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I never forgot that because I like that very much indeed because that does speak of the bigger picture. That exactly speaks of, the bigger, of, of someone who sees the system behind the system. And I think John and Breda saw the importance of that, and they saw the importance of people leave, not, not only of that, uh, but, you know, to have IH was one thing, but to have people leaving and, and taking IH with them was better still. Never mind opposition in terms of money and stuff, there's bigger things than that. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> so you, someone grows in their position, and then I could imagine John saying to them, Okay, right, you've done very well, you've done your growing, uh, and now off you go, uh, and take it somewhere else, and leave your space so someone else can come into it and grow. Um, and it, I had this very much this picture of a good school as something that, that has a really good updraft, which means that people are rising up the ranks and then leaving out the top and, you know, carrying their sparks elsewhere. And I think that this uh, affected the careers of, of many, many, many people who who spent time at IH, who started their careers maybe at IH, and then went on to work elsewhere. The IH diaspora. And people took IH with them. And you know, those are some of the things that I think that they took. <coughs> and I think that atmosphere of practice extends now beyond IH. And as John says, people never really leave. Now, I just have uh, uh, a, a one more thing which I want to do. Uh, that was, and this is a, 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 a shorter and, and uh, quicker thing. Uh, that we're going now to go from the general uh, to the specific, from the marvelous to the absurd. And I, you've got to stand in front of the microphone, right? Okay, so uh, what, what the next bit is just about my own, it's just a short bit of my own uh, autobiography from 1971 to 1972 when I started the course here. Uh, so uh, this is the first time ever, and in fact I only put these words together last night, and I haven't even rehearsed it, so I have no idea how it will go, but actually I'm sure it will be fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. So let me just put that there so I can see it. Great, here we go. So we're going in one small, easy step from sublime to ridiculous. And uh, 
This is the uh, talking international house blues, of course. What else could it be? Uh, there is no particular tune, no particular chorus, and even the words can be invented as you go along. You're welcome to uh, uh, yelp, uh, uh, to sing, to moan, uh, as you wish. Well, I'm going to sing you a song, and it won't be very long. It all started back in 71, when my career had hardly begun. And I lived down in London. I drove a van, 17 pounds a week, 40 hours a week. And I met a friend who earned 25 pounds a week for 25 hours. I said, oh, please, could you tell me what it is that you do? And he said, I teach English to anyone who wants to learn. And you could, too. I said, who needs English? In London, they all speak it. He said, look around. I didn't realize then, but I was just beginning to get the English teaching blues. So I went home and I looked through the yellow pages and I wrote to some schools. I got an interview at a place just off Cambridge Circus. I went in and he said, sit down there, and he said, tell me now and don't mess around. What's the difference between I'm going to the town and I will go to the town? I thought for a while and then I said, look, fella. You won't catch me out like that. Everyone knows they mean just the same thing. He said, well, that's too bad. What you need is a teacher training course. I said, what, you have to train to do stuff like this? He kicked me out and I went home, back to the van driving. I didn't realize I had nothing to lose, but I was still getting the English teaching blues. Then one Sunday evening, around about 8 o'clock, I had this phone call from a Monsieur Rock. He said, you looking for an English teaching job? I said, yeah. He said, can you start tomorrow? I said, yeah, but you should know one thing. I ain't had none of this training. He said, no problem. We'll do it on the phone. Won't take five minutes in your own home. He explained about the secretarial college that he ran above a shoe shop on Oxford Circus. And he said, my English teachers just walked out to be there at nine tomorrow. I said, OK, and you'll let me in? He said, no, no, I won't be there myself, but here's how you get through the door. And what's more, here's how you teach English. Well, I had the English teaching blues. During my second day, Monsieur Rock arrived and he listened outside my classroom door. Lesson observation. And at the end of the day, he said, you did well. Feedback. Now, could you teach the commerce class too? Lesson planning. And on the third day, in walked a young woman with no English at all. By this time, I was pretty much able to recognize a complete beginner. Mr. Rock said, put her in the English class. And I said, no, she can't go there. And I phoned around London for a beginner's class. Hello, this is International House. Oh, yeah? What kind of business would that be? We teach languages. 
Right, but I bet you don't teach beginners. Yes, we do. And advanced classes too. And perhaps, just for you, a little teacher training too. So the guy from the Cambridge School was right. They do train for this stuff. And I realized by now I had the English teaching blues. That very same afternoon, I went down to number 40 Shaftesbury Avenue, which you saw in Jeremy's picture. Great place to go for a language school. When I got there, the staircase was heaving. About 10 people from every country in the world going up and down the stairs. Like a living ELT wall chart. Nearly every kind of person doing nearly every kind of action with nearly every kind of object. But this was International House. In the end, we got up the stairs. I enrolled the beginner. Picked up a pamphlet for teacher training. 30 pounds for a four week course. When I began this song, I said it wouldn't be long and that's because I knew I'd get the International House Blue. for questions. Um, I don't know if anybody's got anything urgent that they'd like to <laughs> ask. Uh, uh, quite pretty difficult to follow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, that, was, that was absolutely amazing. 